Uh, my bio, uh, done a lot of industrial security stuff. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Patrick C. Miller. Um, I'm going to talk about the future. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to see, but it's actually really not that hard when we talk about it like this. It'll make a lot of sense. Um, I do believe we are basically, I titled this Running with Scissors because there's a lot of danger in what we're doing, but I'm going to talk about some, uh, some ways to address that. And I'm going to be the, uh, the heretic in the audience. I'm going to say things that people don't usually want to say and ask questions people don't want to hear. I'm that guy. So we'll start with, uh, interesting, um, embedded. Any software engineers in the room? Raise your hand for a software engineer. It's okay, you can admit it. Um, I know a lot of software engineers, and they are, by and large, they're very lazy, which is a good thing. They're smart, they're brilliant people, but they're lazy. Um, they like to write something, and then they like to reuse that over and over again. And then they embed what they wrote in something else, and they reuse that. And then they do that again. So what we've got is, whether it's, you know, microcode and processors or any of the software we've got right now is full of embedded garbage that we honestly have no idea that it's in there. We've forgotten that it's in there. And this will continue because we really can't go backward. We can't start over. So what you're getting handed today to put into your critical systems, into your safety systems, into anything that you buy is an embedded load of garbage. That's just what we have. Go ahead and admit it and then deal with it. That's what we get to do. That's your job. Eventually, all of this technology that we're using today will vanish from the eye. You will no longer see it. It will be so small that it'll just be everywhere. Berkeley, MIT, they're working on these things called smart dust and other technologies, which are literally nanoscale computing that can do sensing, plant environments, human bodies. You pick a thing. It's, it's there. It's already there. So we've gone from these things that were like room-sized or most you know, kind of recently refrigerator-sized RTUs, pick something like that, and now that same device, there's probably a hundred of them, and they'll all fit on the size of an iPhone. What's that going to be like in the next 10 years? It'll be gone. You won't notice it. So doing your software inventory, your hardware inventory, for example, is going to be very challenging, because that's, you won't be able to see all the technology. It'll just be gone from the eye. Eventually, everything will be connected to everything. All of it. Try to buy an analog piece of equipment today. Good luck. eBay, that's your option, pretty much. Just to buy, you want to buy an analog piece of equipment, you've got to go to eBay. And there's some engineer out there that's been stuffing all old equipment in his garage, and his wife's like, get that out of the garage, and they sell it on eBay. And honestly, a lot of uh, industrial companies, that is their backup plan, is to buy equipment on eBay, because they've got no other choice. Everything else you buy is digital. Everything you buy is digital. Um, and those digital components will be connected to other digital components. It'll all be interconnected. Where, if you look 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was never designed to be connected. That was like, you know, why would you do that? Why would you connect the system? Now it's the expectation is, yes, you're going to connect this. Why are we doing this? Everyone says, oh my God, this is such a terrible idea. Why are we connecting all these devices? Because business. You have to connect it. If you're going to do business in today's modern industrial world, you must connect everything. Why? Because that's where you're going with this. The business needs the data. There we go. We've got a situation where I what I call the logical distance, and this is my own term. Um, you know geographic distance, right? Maybe it's a control center and a substation or a pump head, well head, you know, field equipment somewhere. The distance between those two may be 200 kilometers, right? That's the geographic distance. The logical difference is all of the software, the network stack, the firmware and the mouse. That's the logical distance. We're shimming and we're stuffing more and more things into that space between when you click and something moves out in the field. That logical distance is growing. And it's growing much faster than we can keep our hands up. We cannot wrap our arms around that right now. It's just, it's expanding faster than we can follow. So we have this potential for infinite logical distance between when you take an action on a screen, click an icon, and something out in the field moves. This is another issue in terms of the vulnerabilities that we're creating. And, and basically, again, will be your job to fix. So there's a lot of... Stop doing this. Why are we doing the industrial Internet of Things, um, can, you know, connected vehicles? There's all kinds of great things out there that are... We're, we innovate 
because we're human. We can't stop. It's what we do. It's part of human nature. So you're asking someone to stop innovating. You're asking people to stop thinking of new ideas to use all of this brand new technology. Not going to happen. We're going to innovate faster. We're going to innovate more. We're going to fail more. We're going to go through lots of growing pains and challenges. And that is your job. Stop saying no, because you can't stop it. You're, you're, you're screaming into the wind. You will do no beneficial effort saying stop. What you have to do is up your game and do better to secure it. This is the reality. Innovation will not stop, period. Fix it. Dependence. Um, there's some great examples of uh, 2003 blackout in the US, uh, some other areas, where we've gone from a state where we used to know how to do things manually. We used to know how to literally go out, move the switches, read the meters, and understand what the system looked like in a manual sense, in an analog sense. We've automated everything. I've seen, you know, maybe, you know, industrialists pick a power plant. A power plant used to literally have uh, almost 100 employees. I've seen some that that same plant now has four, hum four humans, and everything else is automated. Could they go back and run that plant manually? Probably not. The dependence on technology is huge. And if you don't believe me, you know, just think for a moment that you left your phone somewhere. You get that cold sweat feeling, right? Your dependence on technology at a personal level is profound. Now, at the industrial level, imagine how much process is dependent upon technology today. Could you go back to doing it manual? Everyone likes to say, oh yeah, we could do this manually. No, no you can't, I'm sorry. It's at least not for an extended period of time. You might be able to do this for a few days, maybe a week, maybe a month. Beyond that, things fail, fast. We're definitely losing touch with the manual craft. This creates an enormous amount of dependence. So, all of these things lead up to the fact that there are some organizations here that are basically a utility or an industrial facility on a state level. They're owned by a municipal government, for example. They're often doing this for the good of the citizens. There are many more organizations that are doing this for money. Because money. <laughs> That's why. So who in here is in the banking industry? Anyone? A handful of them? Well, aside from you, does everybody else remember the day you became a bank? Probably not. You're like, we run water systems, we run power systems, we run chemical refineries. No, you're a bank. Why? Because data is money. Data is the new oil. If you don't believe me, how about those organizations, Maersk, others, that absolutely lost it when they had ransomware? Just wiped them out. Could you operate your business today without your data? Could you operate your business today without your systems? No, you can't. There will be a time when the data you produce is more valuable than your product. Think I'm joking? Just wait. Ask telecom how that works. It's already there for them. This will happen to you. There will be a day when the data you create off of your systems is more, worth more than the electrons, worth more than the oil. The data is where the money is. Look around you and see how much it's actually worth. You're sitting on a bank. Your organization, all of the data in your organization is your money. That is now your business. You need to protect it accordingly the same way you protect your process. So where is all this data coming from? Imagine in the future, we're talking about the industrial Internet of Things, make it to the day, kind of imagine what, if we, if we do a situation where there's like smart dust, where everything that you've got, thousands of field devices are all producing telemetry, all producing data. It's, it's equivalent to what if everybody in the city flushed their toilet at once? Could the city handle it? <laughs> Probably not. You'll be in an absolute swamp, swimming in data. You'll know, you will have no idea what to do with it, except you'll make money with it. Someone will get the idea we can turn all of this data into money. When you have this problem of all these data points pushing data to you, you end up with a situation where you can't handle it all. What happens? Opportunity. Innovative, creative people say, hey, you've got too much data. You don't want to spend all your time trying to store all that data. You don't want to spend all your time trying to analyze that data to make your business better and sell more product. We'll do that for you. 
Third-party services will come in. And yes, you will be forced into the cloud. I said it. Cloud, industrial. Yes, industrial cloud will happen. You will have no choice. You'll have too much data to do this on your own. You will not be able to secure it better than they can, and you will not be able to analyze it better than they can. You'll end up buying the product back from your data. This is where this is going to go. Embrace it sooner or later. Someone else will do it better and cheaper than you do. But you're going to be sitting on that raw material. All that data is still yours. Yes, uh, machine intelligence will also have a play in this. And it's the you know, same thing. It's, it's a natural phenomenon. We forget about things like fish and birds and wildebeest. Um, they, they, they have this kind of emergent intelligence. If you look at a flock of birds, each bird is an individual bird. It's one bird. But when they're together, whether it's food, weather, any other threats, the entire flock moves around it. It creates what's called an emergence intelligence, is this biologic term for it. Our systems are doing the same thing now, and we're enabling that with AI. So there may be a place uh, in the not-too-distant future where a lot of operations is actually done through machine intelligence, because you'll have the data and the third-party services and the horsepower to actually empower that AI or machine learning to make these decisions. This is a reality. It's, it's not, it's actually, there are some organizations attempting to do it now. So can we solve this problem, all of these problems, with technologies? No, we can't. So anybody out there, you've, you've, if you're a security officer or your security team for a big organization, moderate-sized organization, small organization, you've got antivirus, threat intelligence, firewalls, maybe some whitelisting, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection, and the list goes on. You have all of these boxes in some room somewhere generating heat, and honestly, they're failing at security. Someone, some smart human somewhere is going to get past them at some point in time. All the security technologies are, fail are failing. This period. They, they work to a certain extent, but it's not where you put all of your trust. You buy a lot of technology, and honestly, every one of them has failed. If it's not failing right now, it'll fail soon. Technology is not going to solve your problem. Should you still use it? Yeah. Yeah. You still got to buy it all. Sorry, there's no, no just throw it all out and start over. You got to buy all the technologies, but you got to do more than that. Regulation. Can we make some laws, right, that solve this problem? Hackers are faster than laws. Um, I'm going to make a regulation. My regulation is if you ride a bike, uh, we'll say ride a bike to work, you have to lock your bike to a provided bike rack with a U-lock or a cable lock. This bike is compliant. This bike right here is compliant to the law. Totally useless. The difference between security and compliance to regulation or compliance to laws is vast. I mean, those two circles in the Venn diagram barely have any overlap. There are ways to be very secure and completely non-compliant, and ways to be 100% compliant and woefully insecure. Uh, security and compliance really do not necessarily mix in every case. You need to understand the differences and what that means. Every law takes a very long time to create. International laws are even more difficult. I mean, I, I, this is the equivalent. You just, every organization puts up that, no, or every country puts up that no hacking sign on the internet. Right? That stopped everybody. All the hacking is now stopped because we said, don't do it. Laws won't solve the problem. Should we do them? Yeah. Still got to do it. Part of, part of the game. The answer to all of this is people. You. Everyone complains this is a hard job. Yeah, it's a hard job. Innovation's moving too fast. Yeah, it's moving too fast. If you can't do this, get out. That's the reality. This is a hard job. You knew what you signed up for getting into it. You have some very hard problems to solve, seemingly unsolvable problems. We're very good at that. Humans are amazing at this. Every technology that fails, and I've seen industrial incidents, they got through all the security stuff, a human detected it. Some person said, that doesn't look right. I don't trust that. I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing on this screen or on this display. Every single time it comes down to aware people, when technology fails, when anything else fails, it's still people. All of this stuff is revolving around people. All the automation, still people. Someone's got to write the automation. AI, someone's got to actually train the AI. Still people. The solution to all of these problems is you. 
So up your game, put on your big boy pants, big girl pants, and figure it out. That's my plea to you. We have some extremely difficult challenges in front of us, and you guys got to solve this problem because industry industry has got to keep going on, and it's going to move at a much faster pace than you ever expected. So you're here. Grab some business cards, meet some people, get some beers, get some whiskey, find out vodka, whatever it takes, make some friends, and solve some hard problems. That's why you're here, and that's my plea to you as one of your speakers. But the solution is actually you. So. Closing slide. There's a lot of discussion about security. We're at a security event. What do you do with cybersecurity? Um, industrial security, I argue that that's not the goal. We are not here to make the system secure. We're here to keep the system running. And if it's been hacked, if it's been breached, even then, you have to keep the system running. You have to keep the system safe. So the job is not to make it secure. The job is to somehow make it resilient, so that it'll still operate even when under attack, even if it's got to limp along, even if it's got to shut down gracefully. All those things. The, the goal is not security. The goal is keeping the process safe and reliable and resilient. So when you go to your management and you talk to them about industrial cybersecurity, if you have management that will listen, you're lucky, and I want to work for your company because a lot of managers just still don't get it. But if you come to them and say, I want to Minimize risk. I want to keep the organization operating even under an attack. That will get a different ear. They'll listen differently, and you'll likely get the money and support that you need. So the goal is not necessarily security. Yes, you should do some security, but you, this is the primary reason: do it to keep the system running. And that's all I've got for today. Yeah. I'll, same with Marty. If you want to have some discussion, questions, uh, rant at me, tell me I'm wrong. I would love to hear it, and I'll be the first one to buy you a vodka for it. So thank you. <laughs>